In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Peace be with you. And with your spirit. My dear friends, God's kindness has brought us together to bless this new seminary building, the gift of his generosity. Its very name, its very name tells us that the seminary is like a seed bed where the church ministers are nurtured for the work in the Christ the head. Let us therefore ask the Lord that this new seminary may be a school of prayer and divine teaching so that the seminaries it receives may to return to you as devoted pastors and our devoted core workers in the sacred ministry. God, who for glory of your majesty and the salvation of the human race appointed your only begotten son as the eternal high priest, granted those whom you are pleased to select as the ministers and dispensers of your mysteries may be filled with the spirit of wisdom, knowledge, and the holy fear. Help them to put on Christ and to accept their sacred ministry with a pure heart and blameless conduct and to persevere in a faithful, it is a faithful until death. Amen. Brethren, listen to the words of the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every infirmity. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Pray therefore the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. The Gospel of the Lord. Jesus Christ. Dear brothers in the Episcopate and the brothers in priesthood, dear seminarians and brothers and sisters in the faith, I am pleased by your invitation to participate in this blessing ceremony and to address a few words to you. St. Philip's Seminary was founded to provide both intellectual training and an oratorian formation of those who feel called to the priesthood. Since its foundation a little less than 40 years ago, it has attracted seminarians from dioceses and religious communities all over the world. The formation it provides has two evident characteristics. First, the need for seminarians to acquire a solid grounding in philosophy. And second, their need to develop a deep, deep understanding and love of the priestly vocation. The soundness of this characteristic is well evidenced by the large number of St. Philip's graduates ordained to the priesthood in recent years. This is all more remarkable given the uneasy relationship between the Christian faith and the modern ethos. Wherever one is called to exercise a Christian ministry, one now encounters a world in which particular, practically all mainstream institutions, academia and media are driven by the ideologies more than by charity and are often inimical to the faith. The strength of this current seems, at times, to threaten the church. This makes institutions such as this one all the more important. Institution robust Catholic intellectual life, which draw their strength from the unchained truth 
and the faith of the best and greatest of our intellectual heritage. J.K. Uh, Chesterton wrote that the Catholic Church is the only thing which frees a man from the degrading slavery of being a child of his age. In other words, our faith immunizes us against ideological fashions and endows us with the permanent truth about human nature and particularly about the sadness, sacredness of life, marriage and the family, corner stores without which no society can flourish. The Catholic Church now faces the challenge of upholding this truth in circumstances which are not always friendly. Our change is to show that they resonate with both faith and reason. The union of faith and reason in Catholic thoughts, fides querens intellectum, deepens our appreciations for the great gift of God's revelation, but also allows us to recognize the vestigia day in creation and especially in mankind, the crown jewel of this good earth. One of the most important services that we Catholics can offer in the modern world is to draw her attention to the transcendent God, one good, true, and beautiful. In all these areas, the church has made major contributions. She has built the great Gothic cathedrals, reared the development of music and painting, founded the first universities, nurtured the rise of science, promoted human dignity, preached universal charity, cared for the poor, and proclaimed the truth about God, man, and salvation. Christianity once won the heart of the old Greek or Roman world by showing, by showing it the splendor of truth and the joy of goodness, the greatness of faith, and hope and love, and the beauty and dignity of all human life. And it is our hope that, especially through houses and schools such as this, we may once again win the heart of the modern world for God. May he bless us of your hair and grant you the grace to be faithful to this, to this calling. Amen. O oh Lord, we pray, bless you and praise you. In your mysterious and merciful providence, you have established Christ as the one eternal high priest whose unseen power always sustain your church through visible ministries. When the preachers of the gospel proclaim the word of salvation, your son reveals to all people the mystery of your love when the voice of the priest is raised in prayer, Christ prayed with us at your right hand in glory. When the priest celebrates the sacred sacrifice at the altar, Christ again presents to you his own self-offering. When pastors feed and guide the flock entrusted to them, Christ shepherds and guides his church. Watch over, O oh Lord, the oratorians who run St. Philip's Seminary, the seminarians studying here, and all its graduates. Grant, O oh Lord, that the future ministries of Christ gathered here in common life and the study of your holy teaching will be rightly formed for so great a service. Father of all holiness, we pray that those you have chosen to be messengers of the gospel and ministers of the altar will learn through prayer the true truth they must someday teach and with grasp, with the conviction of faith, the mysteries their lives must exemplify. That here they will grow accustomed to offering spiritual sacrifices and by celebrating the liturgy they will experience the saving power of the sacraments. 
that their obedience will lead them to follow the Good Shepherd, so that as pastors of the Lord's flock, they will be ready even to lay down their lives for their sheep. We ask this through Christ our Lord. your heads 
and pray for God's blessing. God never fails to provide his people with pastors. May he pour forth on the, his church the spirit of reverence and courage so that those who accept his call to the priesthood may be the grace of the Holy Spirit strive to live up to his demands. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. May the blessing of Almighty God, Father and Son and Holy Spirit come on this seminary on all who live here, teachers and students, and all of us, and remain forever. Amen. Your Excellency, Most Reverend Ivan Yurkovich, Apostolic Nuncio to Canada, Very Reverend Paul Pearson, Rector and Dean of St. Philip's Seminary and Faculty, members of the Oratory of St. Philip Neri, Reverend Monsignors, Reverend Fathers and Deacons, consecrated men and women seminarians of St. Philip's Seminary, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ. I wish to thank Father Paul Pearson for his very kind invitation to be with you today and for asking me to preach the homily for this Mass. I consider it to be both an honor and a privilege. Today, the Church celebrates the feast in honor of a great saint and doctor of the Church St. Therese of Lisieux. At the time of her death, at 24 years of age, St. Therese, a cloistered Carmelite nun, was only known by the sisters of her convent and her family. It is quite extraordinary that only a few years after her death, she had gained a worldwide reputation as a powerful saint and intercessor. How did this happen? I believe that a partial answer can be found in the Gospel of today's Mass. We hear, At the same hour Jesus rejoiced in the Holy Spirit and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. Jesus states quite clearly that God reveals the greatest mysteries of faith to infants rather than to the wise and intelligent. 
Why? An infant is totally and absolutely dependent upon its mother and father in order to survive. An infant can do nothing on its own. An infant so small and in such great need. So too, if we want to fully appreciate the mysteries of God, we must be dependent rather than independent. We must, as Jesus states, trust in the Lord. For he says, apart from me, you can do nothing. Do we believe that? With our independent spirit, with our strong wills, I want it my way, not your way. In the Gospel of St. Matthew, Jesus states, Truly I tell you, unless you change and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever becomes humble like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. It is much easier for children to believe and to have certainty because for them, life is not complicated. There are few distractions. Very often they are able to accept things that they may not fully understand. They believe. This is the joy of childhood, to believe. They worry not about how or why, they simply believe. To be an infant, totally dependent upon the Lord. To be a child, to believe, to believe in the Lord. St. Therese became so well known so quickly because she developed a spirituality that I believe is the heart of the gospel. It was known as her little way, and it involved becoming like a child. Initially, St. Therese saw her littleness and weakness as a problem, a spiritual liability. She had become quite discouraged by reading the lives of the saints. She saw how they were so holy, so virtuous, so disciplined, they fasted, they prayed without ceasing. She felt that she could never do this because of her weakness, because of her littleness. She was so little, and the task seemed so great. Saint Therese believed that there must be another way. She found it. There was great holiness in being a spiritual child. In her great autobiography, The Story of a Soul, St. Therese writes, and I quote, The good God would not inspire unattainable desires. I can then, in spite of my littleness, aspire to sanctity. For me to become greater is impossible. I must put up with myself just as I am with all my imperfections but I wish to find the way to go to heaven by a very straight, short, completely new way. We are in a century of in innovations. Now one does not even have to take the trouble to climb the steps of a stairway. In the homes of the rich, an elevator replaces them nicely. I too would like to find an elevator to lift me up to Jesus, for I am too little to climb the rough stairway of perfection. She found that elevator in Jesus Christ, who would carry her in his arms like a child. He would raise her up to spiritual heights, and she need not worry nor be afraid. The roadmap for this little way was love. As she states in her autobiography, at last I have found my vocation, in the heart of the church, I will be love. I am a child. It is not riches or glory, not even the glory of heaven, that this child asks for. 
No, she asks for love. She knows but one desire, to love you, Jesus. St. Therese's vocation is really the vocation of all Christians. It is to love Jesus with a childlike trust, to be an infant and to let the Lord do all things for us, to abandon our hearts, our minds, our souls to the Lord, to make his will our will, total and complete spiritual abandonment. Do we love the Lord with all of our heart, mind, and soul? How can our love increase in a world with so many distractions that seem to pull us away from God? How can we overcome what I would call the tyranny of the self, the unholy trinity, me, I, myself? Saint Therese shows us the way if we follow her little way. It is found in humility, love, and an absolute confidence that God will always look after us because we are his beloved sons and daughters. God loves us beyond our imagining and cares for us. For the last nine months of her life, Saint Therese suffered great physical pain. However, the spiritual pain was great, but what was even greater was this thought, these thoughts that plagued her, these thoughts of unbelief. And she received no spiritual comfort. This was also a time of profound spiritual insight as she united herself to Christ on the cross. In many ways, St. Therese was like the Job of the first reading. She was experiencing great difficulty, pain and suffering, and she found herself in a spiritual abyss. God was not near to her. She felt abandoned. But like Job, she never gave up. She put her hope in the Lord. She demonstrated her spiritual confidence, and when she was tempted to despair, she willed herself to believe that the Lord was with her. When she felt unloved, she willed herself to believe, I am a beloved daughter loved by God. When she was tempted to give up, she willed herself to believe, God will strengthen me in all things. She had an unshakable confidence in God, and she never lost hope. This was her childlike trust, and she believed that God would never abandon the ones he loves. Today, we not only celebrate the feast of a beautiful saint, but we also celebrate the completion of a beautiful addition to St. Philip's Seminary. Since 1984, the Oratorian Fathers and Brothers have prepared men for the priesthood with an excellent formation program that is focused not only on the intellectual formation of the seminarians, but also their spiritual and human formation. St. Philip's Seminary focuses on developing in seminarians a love for Christ, for the priesthood, and for his church. Following the exceptional example of St. Philip Neri, who was called, and continues to be called, the second apostle of Rome. The blessing of this edition today is a tangible sign of the good work that is being done at St. Philip's Seminary, for growth is a sign of life. I thank Father Pearson and the faculty of St. Philip's Seminary for their good work in forming approximately 195 priests over the past 38 years. I know that there are many fine priests in my own Diocese of St. Catharines and other dioceses and religious communities that have benefited from your good work in forming dedicated and holy priests who model their lives on Christ. Your fine efforts have borne spiritual fruit. St. Therese had a special love for priests and seminarians, and she prayed for their sanctification. I wish to conclude with a prayer that she had written for a seminarian 
who had asked her to pray for him. Divine Jesus, listen to the prayer I am turning to you for he who wishes to be your missionary. Protect him in the midst of dangers in the world. Make him feel more and more the nothingness of vanity, of fleeting things, and happiness in knowing how to despise them for your love. Your sublime apostolate is already exerted over those who surround him. May he be an apostle worthy of your sacred heart. O Mary, sweet Queen of Carmel, I entrust you the soul of this future priest. Teach him from now with how much love you touched the divine child, Jesus, and how you wrapped him in swaddling clothes so that he one day might go up the holy altar and carry the King of Heaven in his hands. I ask you again to always protect him in the shade of your virginal mantle until the happy moment when, on leaving this valley of tears, he will be able to contemplate your splendor and enjoy the fruit of his glorious apostolate for the whole of eternity. Amen. My dear seminarians, stay close to our Lord and our Blessed Lady. Do not hesitate to ask St. Therese to pray for you, that if it is God's will, you will one day go up to the holy altar and carry the King of Heaven in your hands. Brothers and sisters in Christ, let us follow the example of St. Therese of Lisieux. Never be discouraged. Become little. Be humble. Be confident in God's ever faithful love for you. St. Therese of the Child Jesus, pray for us.